Chapter 14 Missy, where are you taking me? The uneasiness Diana felt was increasing, building, and she had the sudden, frightened notion that this spirit of her supposed sister might be far less benevolent than Diana had assumed her to be. There's something I have to show you. Why can't you just tell me whatever it is you want me to know? Diana was looking around, trying to figure out where in the hotel they were. But the corridor was peculiarly featureless in the gray time, even more so than usual, and seemed to stretch ahead of them forever. This isn't right, she added before Missy could reply. This looks... There's something Quentin's forgotten, Missy said, ignoring both the question and comment. What? Because of what happened to me, he thinks it's about children. Diana only partly heard because Missy had turned a corner as she spoke, and to her surprise, Diana found herself looking at a green door. It was the only spot of color she had ever seen in the gray time. You have to remember this place, Diana? This door? Why? Diana was doing her best to think clearly, but it was becoming increasingly difficult. Because you'll be safe here. When it's important, when you need a safe place, come here. I thought... All places were the same in the great time? Not this place. It's a special place in your time as well as here. It's protected. Don't forget. Diana wanted to ask more questions, but before she could, Missy was going on. Diana, listen to me. Quentin always believed it was about children, but it isn't. Children are easiest because they're so often vulnerable, unprotected, easy prey. It feeds off fear. You remember the terror of a child, don't you, Diana? Her lips felt oddly stiff and very cold when Diana murmured, Yes, I remember. It isn't about the children. It isn't even about me. It's about punishment. It's about judgment. He was judged and punished. Again, Diana wanted to question, wanted to understand all this more clearly, but before she could speak, they both heard Zush felt it. The thumb, the thumb, the thumb. Missy's face changed, and she said quickly, You have to go back now. It can cross over too, Diana. Don't forget that. And a medium's mind can be the most vulnerable of all. If it finds you... Missy, I don't understand. You will. Missy reached out and took Diana's hand, her small one surprisingly warm rather than cold. Don't forget the green door, but go back now. Reach for Quentin. Diana wasn't sure she could because her mind felt sluggish and cold and doing anything at all required too much effort of her. But the warmth of Missy's small hand seemed to chase away part of the chill. The thumb, the thumb. She could hear, I mean, feel the floor underneath her vibrate as though under the steps of something immeasurably heavy and the grayness around her seemed to be darkening, shading toward black. She tried to reach out mentally, thinking of Quentin needing to be with him. There's a bright flash of light, then another, and between them, the gray was getting darker and darker. Hurry, Missy said. It's here, Diana said, opening her eyes. She's, don't do that to me again, Quentin said. She turned her head and looked at him, a little dazed and more than a little confused. He was holding her hand, and his felt warm and strong, and she was once again conscious of that unfamiliar sense of security. Safe. She was safe. Now. Are you all right? He demanded. I think so. He drew a breath and released it, clearly relieved. He didn't let go of her hand. Another visit to the gray time. Diana nodded slowly. Another guide? Missy. That caught him off guard. You talked to her? Yes. And Diana told him about the green door and Missy's warning that it wasn't about hurting children, but was about punishment and judgment. I don't remember a green door in this place, he said. Me either, but it's a safe place for you. Trying to remember exactly what she'd been told, Diana said, I think so. Something about it being a protected place here and in the gray time. A bit grim, Quentin said. If she offered you a safe place, it must mean she believes you'll need one. A cold finger glided up Diana's spine. I guess so. And she said it's about judgment, about punishment. Yes, because he was judged and punished, that killer. 
Samuel Barton. Yes. Quentin digested that for a few moments, frowning, then said, what else? She didn't know if he was using any of his extra senses or if her face was an open book to him, but she knew she had to answer, so she did, telling him what Missy had said about her deepest fears of being unable to handle her abilities and becoming trapped between two worlds, about her terror over what had happened to her mother, and it was only then that Diana remembered something else. My gosh, she said when we visited Mommy, that I was frightened by the people in the hospital, the people without their souls, when we visited Mommy. Quentin, Missy wasn't a half-sister. We had the same father and mother. Stephanie wouldn't have admitted it aloud, but the major reason she asked Ransom Patchett to accompany her down to the basement wasn't to help carry any files or boxes she decided to bring back upstairs. It was because she didn't want to be alone down there. Not that he asked, of course. He used one of the many keys on his ring to unlock the basement access doors. Access door. Then led the way down well-illuminated stairs, saying over his shoulder, I'll give you fair warning, Ms. Boyd. It's hell trying to find anything down here. I told management years ago that the place ought to be cleared out, at least of the junk, but they didn't listen to me. Don't have to, mind you, because I just work here, but still. Stephanie only half listened to him, looking around as they reached the bottom of the steps and feeling a bit sheepish now. The basement was as well illuminated as the stairs had been, and though the vast space was undoubtedly cluttered with what Paget termed junk, there was a kind of order to it all. She could see a dozen big filing cabinets in a smaller, partially walled-off area near the stairs. The bulging cardboard file boxes stacked on top of them, mute evidence that... All of the cabinets were undoubtedly stuffed to capacity, and that more storage space for paperwork had been required. Great, that's just great. I'll be down here for weeks. Sighing, she looked around the rest of the basement space, visible from the foot of the stairs. One section held unused furniture, presumably in need of repair, or perhaps just abandoned due to changing styles and tastes with chairs stacked atop tables and an occasional dust cloth draped over upholstered pieces to protect them. Another section was filled with boxes, most of whose big labels indicated old linens and draperies. In yet another area, shelves held an amazing assortment of outmoded kitchen gadgets, cheek by jowl with what looked like stacks of old magazines and newspapers. And leaning against the shelves were dozens of large frame prints, again, presumably, moved down here due to changing tastes. My gosh, she muttered, did they throw anything away? Not so as you notice, Paget said in mild disgust. Ought to, though. There's plenty of charities would love some of this junk. And gosh knows the textiles they saved are likely rotten or moth-eaten after so many years. There's a whole stack of rugs in one of the back corners that were probably worth a fortune in their day. Not much left of them now. He shrugged. Anything's needed up in the hotel, they always buy new. So I don't get why the old and broken stuff ends up down here. Saving for a rainy day, I suppose. They both listened to a rumble of thunder so low and long that they could feel the vibrations of it beneath their feet. And Paget lifted an eyebrow at her. Stephanie had to laugh, but said, Well, I'm not going to be the one to tackle this. That's all I know. Or at least I'm not planning to go through anything except the paperwork. I have to say, though, this space is a lot more inviting than I'd expected, even with all the clutter. At least the paperwork seems to be filed fairly neatly and all in one place. Patchett gave her a pitying look, then beckoned her to follow as he headed toward the section piled high with furniture. A couple managers back, somebody had the bright idea to get all the old lodge records and other paperwork in its own space. Nice and neat and organized instead of just stacked wherever there happened to be a bit of clear floor or an empty shelf. Most of it got moved eventually out of all the scattered corners of this place, but not all. Stephanie followed him around the furniture and bit back a groan when she saw a rather dark corner piled high with obviously old ledgers and file boxes and even several old banded trunks. Jesus, she muttered. The light's not great here, Paget said. 
Why don't I start dragging all this stuff back toward the stairs? At least then you'll be able to see what you're looking at. That's assuming you want to start in on this stuff. His face said clearly enough that he hoped she'd return to the file cabinet, which would obviously keep her busy for a long time. Stephanie hesitated and said, I guess the stuff here would have contained some of the oldest records, right? Yeah, probably. It all used to spill out a lot farther in this corner with boxes stacked right up against the furniture. So I'd expect the oldest stuff to be back in that corner against the walls. He eyed her. I've been here about as long as anybody, so if I knew what you were looking for, I might be able to shorten the search. Briskly, she said, well, I don't really know myself, but since you offered to help, why don't you grab some of that stuff and start bringing it closer to the stairs? I don't know how much time I've got before the next crisis erupts, so I might as well do what I can in the meantime. Yes, ma'am. Leaving him to it, Stephanie retreated to the organized area near the stairs and, drawing a deep breath and flipping a mental coin, opened a file drawer at random to start her search. She didn't have a clue what she was looking for, but she had a hunch she'd know it when she found it. That's the last of this lock, Quentin said, setting aside the largest of the two boxes. Anything helpful? Not as far as I can see. A few interesting letters from around the early 1900s written to guests and staff, but nothing to indicate unsolved disappearances or other mysteries here. Diana gestured toward the old photograph stacked on the coffee table before her and said, same here, more or less. I've gone through all the photo albums and all the loose photos we found. Interesting pictures, most without even a date on the back, but nothing that sends up a red flag. Well, the universe never makes things easy. So I've noticed, she shook her head. Maybe there's nothing else here and all I was meant to find was the one picture. <clears throat> It lay alone on the coffee table within easy reach of Diana, and she glanced at it often. That picture of two little girls and a dog, a moment frozen in time. Could be, Quentin agreed, signs importance. Signs and portents. Not importance. <laughs> Is that what we're looking for? Who knows? Bishop calls them signposts and says too many of us walk right by them without noticing. It's probably true. I mean, most people are too busy just getting through the day to pay much attention to hints from the universe. So what do these signposts look like, according to Bishop? Since Diana had asked him to talk about the special crimes unit while they went through the stuff from the attic, Quentin had obliged. She hadn't wanted to talk any more about the experience the storm had triggered, obviously needing time to come to terms with it. And he was reluctant to push her, even though questions and thoughts were still swirling in his mind. Instead, he had talked about the SCU as the storm had gradually faded away outside, and they had worked their way through most of the stuff brought down from the attic, offering thumbnail sketches of some of his fellow team members, as well as a few of the more interesting war stories involving the unit. He wasn't at all sure she had even listened to him, and half suspected she'd only wanted the sound of another voice in the room, the sense of another person while her own thoughts were miles away. But he had jumped at the chance to talk about the unit, feeling it was important for her to hear about things that would make her own paranormal experiences at least sound fairly ordinary by comparison. She had, it seemed, heard at least some of what he told her. Signs and portents. Purity and yes. They can look like anything that's the hell of it, he answered her. The more ordinary, the more likely they are to be anything but. For instance, he reached for the last box he had to go through, and from the jumble of its contents produced a very old cigar box. This. This is, what, the thir third lost and found box we've come across? At least. And the same sort of stuff inside. He opened the box and inspected its contents. Bits of jewelry, a cigarette lighter, assorted keys, hair combs and clips a fountain pen, a rabbit's foot, nail clippers, coins, junk mostly, stuff the original owners have long, long since forgotten about. But who knows if there's a signpost in here, a sign or a portent just lying in this ordinary little box for somebody paying attention, there could be, in a cigar box filled with junk. You know what they say, one, man junk, one man's junk is another man's treasure. 
Quentin shrugged, though it's not intrinsic value that matters, of course. Like I said, any sign tends to be something ordinary, at least at first glance, or even at second glance. Diana held out her hand, and when Quentin gave her the box, began going through the contents almost idly. I'd say this stuff was pretty ordinary, all right. How are we supposed to recognize signs in importance? They're just average, everyday things. What does your bishop say about that? <clears throat> well, to me, he said something typically cryptic. He said he had to pay attention to everything, and the important bits would make themselves conspicuous at some point along the way. I guess the universe doesn't like to be obvious. Apparently not. Quentin hesitated, then said carefully, If you're right about your father coming here, he should be able to give us at least some of the answers. Diana was frowning slightly as she continued to gaze into the box on her lap. But will he? That's the question. And even if he does, will his answers be the truth? You think you try to keep a lie going even in the face of this? That depends on why he started the lie in the first place, doesn't it? And we don't have so much after all. A photograph of two little girls, as long as you've known all these years. I mean, as far as you've known all these years, Missy lived here with her mother. We can't prove otherwise, can we? No, Quentin admitted, at least not with any information I found to date. There was never a hint from Missy or from anything I found since her death to indicate that Laura Turner wasn't her natural mother. In fact, in the police files of the original investigation is a photocopy of Missy's birth certificate, supposedly anyway. Born Missy Turner, daughter of Laura in Knoxville, Tennessee, father unknown. You never thought of, you never thought that could have been a fake. About 10 years ago, I went as far as checking original hospital records and there was a child named Missy Turner born to a Laura Turner on that date, just as the certificate noted. I had no reason to dig any deeper. Diana nodded, but said the way Missy spoke when I was with her, when she said we visited Mommy, was so natural that I'm positive she meant exactly what she said, that the two of us went to visit our mother. I'm going to pause there and finish later with chapter 14 to be continued.